right? So this is going to be the second uh, review video for this unit. And this is talking about the synaptic vesicle. And we left off in the last video talking about um, the end plate potential. And this kind of leads us into a discussion of what um, the definition of a quantum. There was this early theory that uh, neurotransmitters were released in these units, right? So this is kind of what eventually led to the vesicle hypothesis. But they noticed that when neurotransmitters were being released or when they were seeing a response in the postsynaptic neuron, those responses were often stereotypes to a specific amount. And we know that neurons have baseline activity. So we can define quantum as a packet, in this case, of neurotransmitter. And what I mean by packet is that it's a, it's a defined amount that's going to be consistent um, relatively across the release of multiple different vesicles. So we talked about how neurons have this baseline activity. Um, this is just to get you guys to think about the fact that neurons release synaptic vesicles, usually in response to some kind of action potential in the presynaptic neuron. However, this entire process is mediated by calcium entry. And even though the calcium concentration within the neuron is really low, it does exist, right? There are some free unbound calcium molecules. So every once in a while, um, you're going to see, actually forget, forget baseline activity. That's not the word I want to use. Um, the word I want to use is spontaneous activity because every once in a while you're going to get this, let me spell spontaneous activity. Every once in a while you're going to get this aberrant release of synaptic vesicles and usually they exist as these distinct like one vesicle packets because you're going to get such a small amount of calcium leading to exocytosis that sometimes it affects just one synaptic vesicle or just two or just three. And this is going to be a function of random release of synaptic vesicles. And this is what's going to create in our uh, neuromuscular junction that miniature end plate potential. What I mean by that is during this spontaneous release, right, when the neuron is supposed to be inactive and every once in a while a, a packet of neurotransmitter just happens to be released from the presynaptic, if I'm measuring from the postsynaptic, I'll see these tiny little bumps. And maybe there's two vesicles behind, so the bump's a little bigger. But it, it demonstrated to early scientists that there were distinct units. relating to the release of quantum packets of neurotransmitter. And this is what eventually led them to this idea that neurotransmitters were sequestered in these defined amounts into these synaptic vesicles and then they're released. And we know now that the quantum size can change and that there's, there's all kinds of stuff that affect this. But it, it really allowed them to think about neurotransmitter release as existing as a function of these groups of neurotransmitter all being released at once, right? So is it one synaptic vesicle? Is it two synaptic vesicles being released? Or as in the case with some synapses in like the frog retina, in response to activity, it can release tens of thousands every millisecond, right? So how many synaptic vesicles is being released can be inferred if you know the size of the quantum. So let's say the quantum is each, um, each synaptic vesicle induces a two millivolt depolarization in the postsynaptic neuron. If you see a four millivolt depolarization, you know that two synaptic vesicles were um, released from the presynaptic neuron. So this kind of led them to think about, well, okay, so if vesicles are the big idea here, where do they come from? Um, how do synaptic vesicles come about? 
where they made or they recycled. So that led us to this idea that synaptic vesicles are recycled and produced. So this was another early argument. People were wondering, well, are they recycled continuously at the membrane or are they produced in the cell body and trafficked to, down to the terminal? And of course, the answer is always both, right? So here's our presynaptic terminal. And to create new synaptic vesicles, you need protein synthesis. And we know this because we have those vesicle-associated membrane proteins that are responsible for things like the snare hypothesis that we'll talk about here in a sec, that um, are responsible for all, ki all kinds of different um, vesicle-related tasks. Think back to when we were pumping neurotransmitter into the synaptic vesicle, we need proteins in there. We need proteins within the membrane of the synaptic vesicle itself, right? So here's our synaptic vesicle. We need proteins within here. And if we need proteins, we need protein synthesis. And we know that protein synthesis occurs within the cell body of, of any cell, really. So we know that in some way, synaptic vesicles must be trafficked from the cell body to the um, axon terminal. And for a long time, they thought that this was conclusive proof that each synaptic vesicle, each time neurotransmitter re was released, it was a new, completely new synaptic vesicle. But then people started to wonder, well, if you're putting, you know, with every time you put a synaptic vesicle within the membrane, every time you lead to synaptic vesicle exocytosis, that presynaptic membrane gets bigger. And you want to have some way to reclaim that membrane. Otherwise, the size of the presynaptic terminal is just going to keep increasing and increasing and increasing. So... This kind of forced them to think, okay, is there another factor at play here? Is there something else that's, that's allowing us to produce vesicles? And what they found is that each synaptic vesicle can recycle, I want to say it's about, I'm going to totally botch this number, but it's around 200 times, or I could be completely off. But essentially, there's a defined limit to how many times a synaptic vesicle can recycle before it gets old and the proteins start to denature, and then it's degraded, and it's replaced with a new one from the cell body. But synaptic vesicles, once arriving at the cell body, can recycle multiple times. They can perform multiple different um, vesicle releases, right? So we now know that synaptic vesicles are recycled. And so this kind of forces us to define our steps of, of the synaptic vesicle cycle. So we can say, here's number one. Synaptic vesicle reaches the synaptic terminal thanks to um, trafficking along probably microtubules, right? So this is going to be uh, kinesin-directed, that's plus N-directed transport, all the way down to the axon terminal. We talk about microtubules, we have a plus N and a minus N. Plus N is towards the terminal, minus N is towards the cell body. Once this synaptic vesicle reaches the synaptic terminal, It has to enter this like cytoskeletal framework. I need to draw it like this. And this is called the reserve pool. So this is the reserve pool. And the sequestering of the synaptic vesicle to the reserve pool is mediated by um, different molecules. I want to say they're called synapsins. I don't think we care that you know that. But essentially, once there is a need for this synaptic vesicle to kind of enter the active recycling pathway, it buds off there by way of some kind of scaffolding mechanism where it, it travels along different scaffolding proteins. It ends up in a relatively close proximity to that axon terminal. And then there's a couple different processes, the terminology of which is often... Um, hard to understand. So I like to think of this as the vesicle is being sequestered to the membrane. So for number three here, I'll say um, vesicle sequestering. And the, the proteins involved here aren't really that well understood, but we know that there's something that kind of reaches around this vesicle and pulls it towards 
the membrane, right? So number four here, we're sitting relatively close to the membrane. And then I'm actually gonna say that this process here is vesicle sequestering. Then once it gets towards the membrane, it's kind of associated with the membrane. And that's via these um, snare complexes. We say that this, this synaptic vesicle at number four is docked. So this is a docked synaptic vesicle. But that doesn't mean that it's ready to be released. In fact, um, it, what it takes is this winding of these snare complexes to actually uh, lead it to the, what's called the readily releasable pool. So we can say that this winding kind of forces the synaptic vesicle closer to the membrane here. And it leads to the synaptic vesicle being within the readily releasable pool. So this is number five, um, snare winding. At number five, the synaptic vesicle is in the readily releasable pool. At which point, a neurotransmitter coming in here or uh, sorry, an action potential invading this terminal is going to lead to the influx of calcium via voltage-gated calcium channels that are, again, sequestered pretty close to this synaptic vesicle and all these snare complexes, binds to uh, calcium entry, binds to something called synaptotagmin. All right, that's synaptotagmin. And that leads to vesicle release, right? So that's what creates these things that we call omega figures. Um, called that because they look like, you know, the Greek letter omega. Right. So that leads to neurotransmitter release. But then this stretch of membrane that was part of the vesicle is now part of the presynaptic membrane itself. So the, the presynaptic membrane has gotten slightly bigger. Within this, this um, vesicular stretch of membrane, you have these proteins called vesicle-associated proteins. These are recognized by molecules that are, um, that are contained within the clathrin uh, triskelion matrix. So this clathrin coat stretches around this, these vesicle-associated protein regions, leads to the invagination of this membrane, right? So here's, leads to an invagination of this membrane, and then a protein called dynamin, the GTPase, actually pinches off this synaptic vesicle and puts it back in here, to where it can be recycled. And the reason I drew this reserve pool for you is that eventually this synaptic vesicle, as it recycles however many times it recycles, it's eventually gonna become deformed. The proteins are gonna start to denature. So I like to draw it kind of like this. So here's our old synaptic vesicle. This is targeted for minus end trafficking to go back to the cell body to potentially be degraded. The reason this is important is that if you have a, like a seriously intense um, activity in the presynaptic neuron, these old synaptic vesicles can actually be used kind of as like a backup. Um, they're not as good as the normal synaptic vesicles, but they do um, tend to work okay, right? So if you really need to be releasing neurotransmitter, the cell kind of has a mechanism in place to say, all right, like, let's mobilize these old synaptic vesicles.